Hey there, everyone. My name is John Motto with Beacon Financial Strategies. I'm the client service representative right here, and I wanted to thank you for your for joining us here today um, for our live webinar event where we're going to uh, give a little economic update and outlook. Um, but before we get started, I did want to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, first off, your video and your audio are on mute. So if you're having lunch, just continue to enjoy your lunch and don't worry about us seeing you. Um, additionally, this webinar is designed to be educational in nature, not to necessarily recommend a strategy or give advice. There will be a question and answer. Um, at the end, there's a little message box down there, Q&A. Um, if you have a question for us, I know Nick and Chip would love to hear from you. Um, the hosts of this webinar are Chip Heimiller and Nick Faulkner, our investment team here at Beacon Financial Strategies. And with that being said, Nick, I'll hand it over to you. Hey, everyone. Thanks, John, for that um, opening. That was great. Um, John always uh, brings a smile to everyone. So uh, appreciate that, John. So everyone, thanks for coming. Um, just kind of want to start off with a few important reminders for all investors. Um, your investment strategy should be based on your long-term financial goal. Um, Portfolio risk and returns are based on the stock bond mix of your portfolio. So, you know, if the market's down 20%, 25%, more times than not, that is not what your portfolio is down. We have bonds, you have large cap stocks, international stocks. There's a variety of stocks diversification in your portfolio. And lastly, research has shown that portfolios benefit from a globally diversified approach, just like I talked about, and frictional costs where we can manage those low expense funds, um, and just kind of like look at it as a holistic approach. So now I want to go through the market performance summary. And this is it's kind of a phenomenon almost. We look at these one-year numbers and they're astounding. I mean, 60% for small cap, 42% for US, that's not normal at all. But if you look back to a year ago, we were coming right out of a decline when the market was down 33%. And I'll show that in the next slide. But if you look as we extend out over time, these 10-year numbers are still a good and a little high, but you know, we see that start to kind of boil down and get to the norm of what we would usually expect. Again, I think it's still a little high if you look at the average. Um, and if we we can talk about, you know, international a little bit, it has been underperforming. But from a valuation standpoint, we believe that, number one, it provides diversification port for your portfolio. And two, again, valuation, P ratios and such are, are better um, look better really than U.S. stocks, and um, and we you know get into that a little bit later on the overall view of the U.S. economy right now. And another thing I wanted to highlight is if we look at the bond market, the bond index right now, we see negative numbers. And why is that? A lot of that is due to low interest rates right now, because you know when interest rates are low, that drives the return on bonds lower as well. But we don't look at bonds as an overall for growth in our portfolio, right? It's for diversification, for risk mitigation, for risk management, and also for our people, our clients, or whoever may be in the distribution phase this is a great, you know, pool to pull from where the stock market's down 30%. We really don't want to take distributions from your stock funds right now because they're in that decline. Maybe we're going to take some from the bond portfolio or bond portion of your portfolio. And that's, that's really beneficial to people who are adequately diversified as well. Um, and so now moving on to the next slide, going to kind of give you a chart of what happened in the past year, right? I mean, it's almost a blip at this point, but we see right here, the market was down 33% in a matter of three weeks from February to March 23rd was really the bottom of the market where it was where we were down. And it's really astounding at, at the time. And Chip, uh, you can feel free to chime in if you want to, but um, I don't know about people listening on this call, but it was a, it was a very educational time for me. And, and I think for, for everyone that, man, markets don't always go up, do they? I mean, you see, you know, this line, 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 then we have this drop, but it was really short lived right by the end right here of July, beginning August, we kind of saw the correction and it was pretty much a V-shaped recovery. 
And since then, it's kind of led us to where we are now, where we're at an all-time, almost an all-time high of the S&P 500, which, again, this mark, this graph shows the S&P 500, which is essentially an index of U.S., large U.S. companies, the largest in the U.S., and it um, just shows how they performed over the past, you know, this graph is three years or four years, but um so the S&P 500 is just an index of the 500 largest companies in America. And so, but closing out, we're at a high now. So where does that lead us going forward? And as we look forward, you know, we really don't know, right? It, it could drop, it could keep on going up. But if we look historically over time, we have seen that, you know, these large numbers of 14% one year look ahead from an all time high, 10 percent three year look ahead and even 10% on a five-year look ahead. And that's, we're not saying that, okay, next year the market's going to go up 14%. But I think it is worth noting that when we are at that all-time high, we don't see an immediate drop that continues and continues out. Um, and so that's that's really uh, important to to know and to um, to keep in mind as we go forward and as we, we may hit an all-time high next week and the next week and the next week. And we can, you know, keep looking for, okay, when's it going to pull back? which it may, but I think it's important to know that over time and historically speaking, we really don't see that much of a drawback in the short term after an all-time market high. And so now we've kind of drilled down on the market, the U.S. market and kind of what's going on recently. I want to bring Chip in to talk about a more high-level view of the overall U.S. economy and, and what's going on there. Right. Thank you, Nick. I mean, you know, as looking at that, you know, we get a questions a lot from clients, you know, should I wait to invest, you know, months from now after the correction happens? I know, Nick, you and I talk about this all the time. That's, you know, it, 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 there's always going to be some fear on the horizon. And, you know, you can't let that get in the way of your own strategic long term um, plan, you know, so is it a good time to invest now? I don't know, Nick, what's your opinion on that? I, I, I tend to think that it's, it's, you know, it's always a good time to invest if your time horizon is right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's, I think it's always a good time to invest it unless, you know, I want to buy a house in the next year. I want to make this big purchase for the next year, the next two years. That's when I would say maybe let's hold off for a second, but you know, if we're talking long-term, I, I think, always is really good time to it. Yeah. And, and the other thing too, is to keep in mind that you're, you know, you may not be investing only in stocks, right? If you have a, if you're, if your investment objective is more moderate in nature, you may invest in, you know, 60% stocks and 40% bonds. So you're not piling all into the market, the stock market all at once. And so, you know, I think it's just, uh, to me, we can't predict or time the market. And uh, you kind of have to say, well, if my time horizon is appropriate, by and large, I'm better off owning uh, some diversified mixture of stocks and bonds over time, just because, you know, that's just the prudent way to, to proceed uh, with a long term strategy. So I want to go on and talk. We're, we're getting a lot of questions nowadays about the economy and what's happening with the economy. And we're seeing some funny numbers. And I know the press kind of. Uh, alludes to uh, some of these uh, anomalies that's happening and kind of what I, I really think they blow them out of proportion a little bit. Uh, but I wanted to start a little bit with uh, GDP or gross domestic product. And you can kind of see um, over time that we have been holding a pretty steady, you know, low uh, 2%, 3% types of growth rates up until the first quarter of last year. Uh, when, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the fears of the pandemic started materializing. Um, and then really the, the escalation of that happened in the second quarter of, uh, of 2020, when, you know, essentially uh, for a period of time, the economy you know, really ground to a halt, you know. And uh, I know that we uh, were having conversations with clients at that time, and we we're talking about that, you know, no one's driving, no one's traveling. No one's buying uh, buying things anymore. So it's, it's you can't buy things, you know, other than Amazon, you know, which was a savior at the time. But you know, you can see uh, really in the numbers that we uh, experienced a huge drop off in in um, you know GDP during that period of time. 
Now, since then, we've seen a bounce back, really a snapback. And, you know, the economy has has thought a little bit. Uh, things in most sectors of the economy weren't really as bad as what um, we thought they were going to be. Uh, but, you know, in the in the third quarter uh, of 2020, things started to get a little bit better. And so we see this snapback. And, you know, the numbers here, this was a negative 32 percent or almost 33 percent decline in GDP uh, for that quarter. And then and then we saw a nice bump up here uh, of about 38 percent. Uh, in the Q3 of 2020. And that's kind of continued over time. But uh, keep in mind that we're, you know, when we're talking about uh, backward looking numbers, it, it's, uh, we're, we're going to see some weird things coming out now. And, you know, that's, that's kind of what's happening. If you, if you look at this, this chart here on the right, uh, it's just the GDP growth uh, over time, we see this giant decline, but then we've seen a nice bounce back, but it's not back to the normal area. The economy is, um, you know, is still uh, uh, regaining steam and trying to get back to where we were prior to um, the pandemic. And we expect that to happen at some point, you know, uh, certain sectors, I know airline and some travel and, and things are doing pretty well now uh, during this recovery. So ho hopefully that will uh, continue going forward. Um, unemployment. So again, you see this trend uh, coming out of the Great Recession of, uh, you know, gradually declining unemployment rates. And, you know, that's generally a good thing. I mean, people who are employed are spending money. They're, um, you know, creating jobs, essentially. And so just uh, just by the mere fact of that they're spending money. And so, but as the pandemic materialized, we see this giant, you know, uh, really a, a, a steep decline of um, unemployment rate. Uh, it, it's, it's, it actually went to about 14.8%, I think, at, at uh, uh, the peak and so in the short term. And so, of course, a lot of those jobs came back pretty quickly. Um, we're still struggling a little bit to find. I know, I know the press is, um, you know, harping on the fact that it's it is a shortage of labor. I mean, people are uh, still reluctant to come back uh, to jobs that they once had. Our economy is changing. I mean, some some uh, segments of the economy, restaurants and that sort of thing, are going to, be, you know, it's going to be a constant change. I don't I don't think we'll ever go back. Uh, to the same, uh, exactly the same as it was. And so, uh, but nevertheless, we're seeing unemployment rates uh, gradually decline. I think um, uh, last week, uh, the numbers came out and looked more sub 6%, which I think is uh, really actually a low unemployment rate uh, relative to historical measures. And so things seem to be improving there, uh, which I think is a, a, a good sign. Um, I always... Uh, think about uh, the treasury yield curve from the standpoint of what does that mean for the economy? Well, you know, it, it well, from one standpoint, it means interest rates are low for people who are borrowing money, right? Banks base their interest rates for mortgages and car loans and that sort of thing on uh, uh, treasury interest. And so uh, right now, interest rates are, are pretty low. And, and that's great for people who are borrowing and spending money. You know, for a lot of our clients who are have maybe are beyond that point in their life where they're, they're mostly in the uh, saving and investing mode, if you're a conservative investor, it's kind of a negative sign, right? It's, you know, gosh, I'm, I'm uh, investing my money at a super low interest rate. Nick kind of hit on that uh, a second ago. Uh, and and it's, it's not a great um rate of return on bonds and um, CDs and money market and that sort of thing. But, you know, and as he pointed out, it's keep in mind that that's OK. Um, the purpose of that segment of your portfolio is not for growth. It's for the opposite. It's for liquidity. It's for uh, preservation. It's for stability. It's to fund these uh, uh, future cash flows. And so I think that we're not depending on uh, bonds to uh, enhance performance in client portfolios. We're depending on bonds to generate 
a little income maybe, and then and also provide a nice ballast of security and, um, and stability. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, you know, one of the big topics that we've been hitting on in a lot of our meetings with clients is what's going on on the inflation front. And, you know, I think that anyone who is um, uh, fairly aware uh, can see that we are seeing some inflation in certain areas of the economy. Um, you know, if you're in the housing market, if you're if you're in the process of trying to buy or build a home, um, it's, uh, you know, probably pretty stressful because prices are rising in rapid fashion there. There's, you know, I think I read where there's at least five to eight uh, buyers for every seller. Uh, so more people are buying uh, real estate than, than selling and that creates a, a, a shortage of some, a supply shortage. And so that just kind of drives the prices up a little bit. So, you know, I think that that is something to be aware of. And, um, and we'll talk about that in a minute as we talk about consumer price index. And so if uh, the CPI is a number you've probably heard, and there are different varieties of CPI now. So um, there's CPIU, there's uh, CPI core, and then there's, you know, uh, just the standard CPI. Uh, and, you know, we're kind of looking at the standard CPI where it includes lots of things. It includes foods, energy, housing, um, all kinds of items. And um, one thing I always like to remind people is just because you see inflation, inflation rises uh, in the economy, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's impacting you in a big way. And so, you know, if you're not in the housing market and you're not buying a house, it doesn't really in, uh, uh, affect you. And so just keep that in mind because um, what happens, uh, you know, what, what impact is a big impact for one person is not a big, big impact for others. Um, so this chart shows the consumer price index and what's happened uh, kind of over the last 20 years or so. And if you look here, you know, during the Great Recession, we were um, uh, right, right as we start, started getting into the Great Recession, we saw this huge bump in CPI. And, um, you know, we saw this rise. And then, you know, of course, about that time, the bottom kind of dropped out. We saw, I actually saw a little bit of deflation here, uh, which is a very um, uh, punishing uh, economic event as well, right? The deflation is pretty rare. We like to see a little bit of inflation in the economy, not, um, you know, significant inflation. And so, but over time, you know, we've kind of bounced around between this two and 3% range. And, um, you know, but recently, you know, we've seen coming out of the pandemic again, a, a nice spike. Now, uh, what does that mean? Does that mean, oh, this is the beginning of the end of, you know, this uh, Goldilocks type of inflationary environment? Um, what does that mean for me? Is my, are my reti is my retirement plan at stake? And, and honestly, you know, I, I don't think that's necessarily the case, but I think it's important to look at what people are saying. OK, what what's the general consensus out there? And inflation is one of those things like any other thing that happens uh, in our world here in finance. Right. Everyone has an opinion. You know, there are some people who thinks, oh, gosh, the uh, inflation is getting ready to just rage. Um, you know, it's a time bomb. It's waiting to happen. Everything is in place for this, you know, grand uh, inflationary and hyperinflationary environment. You better be scared and you better prepare yourself right away. You know, and you can see those uh, uh, pundits who say that. Then there's people on the other side of that saying, OK, um, this is a temporary event. It's caused by you know, it's caused by pent up demand. I mean, people have been basically stationary sitting at home for the last, you know, year or so, and they've been saving money and, and they're ready to travel. They're ready to move out. They're ready to get out. They're ready to, you know, uh, do things again. And, uh, and some people have even, uh, you know, had a long period of reflection and want to change the way they, you know, just in general, how they operate. They want to buy a vacation home. They want to do some of these things that, you know, they they have uh, decided that's important to them. And so, you know, I think you have to be careful whenever you're listening to the media at, um, you know, 
the situation in general is ne not nearly as good or as bad as what the media might make it out to be. You know, we kind of think of ourselves as, you know, a real, a realist, right? You know, well, we might have inflation, we might not. Does it really matter at the end of the day? And, you know, it, it does a little bit. I mean, I think you, you need to think about that and need to plan around that, um, you know, and, and, and prepare for that. But it's not a deal breaker. It doesn't mean that, OK, if we see, uh, you know, if inflation rises to six percent and kind of hovers there for a few years, um, is 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 your lifestyle going to be impacted in a dramatic fashion? Are you going to run out of money in some way? And I just don't know that that's the case. Um, so I think it's important to, to go through, you know, what is our take, you know? And at the end of the day, I'll say that the global economy is so complicated. There's so many unpredictable and moving parts. It's just impossible to, you know, base, um, you know, decisions in the micro day time uh, and get that correct. You have to kind of take this approach of, well, it's a long time horizon. I want to protect myself now. I don't, I don't want to uh, be foolish, but by the same token, you know, I need to have a much longer um, period of time where, you know, we're, our, our viewpoint is so much longer. I mean, our, our, um, uh, the amount of time uh, in retirement is a long time, right? So you have to just kind of think that through and be aware of that. You know, no one really knows the details about how things are going to materialize. I will be the first to tell you, I have no idea. Um, you know, I, I wish that I did. I wish I could say with complete accuracy, yep, we're going to see, you know, X percent inflation, and this is what we need, need to do to combat that. Um, and then, you know, it's only going to last for, you know, six months or a year, and then we need to make this change and, and proceed forward. I would love to be able to do that, but I can't do that. Uh, and I would really suggest that anyone who claims to have that um, magic bit of insight, you ignore them because they just it's, it's not possible to understand those. What I would say uh, our advice is, is to really focus on those elements um, of your situation that are in your control. Well, what does that mean? It means maintaining a diversified investment approach, use low cost investments. Um, be tax efficient in your investment strategy um, and, and really have a risk profile of your investment portfolio that is consistent with your cash flow needs. You know, that's what to me is uh, the most important elements to focus on. Also, take advantage of financial pl planning opportunities that arise along the way. And there are tons of things that have happened. I mean, I can just look back in the last 10 years, there have been uh, many tax laws that have changed. There have been many uh, market corrections. There have been all kinds of things that have happened that have really presented opportunities. And, you know, there are people who, um, if you're uh, strategic and calculated and, um, you know, focused on controlling those things that you can control, you can find pockets of opportunity. And a lot of times uh, they come during these periods of, uh, of stress uh, on the economy. Um, you know, also, it, I do think it is important over time to reassess things. You know, has your financial plan changed? Has your retirement plan changed? Is your portfolio um, uh, adequately allocated to stocks and bonds and other um, types of investments that could, could withstand a period of inflation? You know, have, has your budget changed? I mean, I mentioned earlier, you know, just because there's inflation in the system doesn't necessarily mean that it impacts you. You know, but it could also be, you know, just because there's no inflation in the system doesn't mean that you aren't impacted. Right. I can tell you the last 10 years um, uh, in the CPI has been pretty low. But if you are someone who's had medical expenses, uh, you could you would call my bluff there and say, well, for me, it's been, uh, you know, I've, I've experienced tons of inflation. And, and it happens. So you just need to go back and look through and confirm all these things. It's, it's um, uh, super um, necessary over time just to make sure that no adjustments need to be made. Um, we're getting the question a lot here uh, recently, should I adjust my portfolio? Should I, you know, some people will come and say, gosh, should I exit stocks because we're at an all-time high? 
you know, things are looking awful rosy and I'm sure that the carpet's going to be pulled out. You know, other people are saying, gosh, why should I uh, invest in these bonds? Interest rates are so super low. Why would we, why would we stick to a, you know, one and a half or 2% rate of return, which is really losing uh, from an inflation adjusted basis. You know, so we get people on both ends of that spectrum. And, but for most people, if you've done a good job of, uh, thinking through strategically how to position your portfolio, um, you're probably not going to need to make any changes. That's already been taken into account. I mean, with our clients, we look at their retirement plan and base our investment um, uh, recommendations on that plan. You know, and we we look at cash flows. When are you going to need those cash flows? How? What is the timing of that? And we help think through those um, decision points. And so, you know, do you need to make adjustments? Probably not. Uh, that's kind of my advice. And Nick, you might want to circle in and, and add a little bit there. I think that we've had so, so many meetings uh, with people here over the last year. Uh, a lot of times it's they're scared and worried, uh, but oftentimes it's the same types of, of questions that they have. And and they're just really concerned about, you know, is there something I need to do now? And uh, by and large, right, it's it's not a lot that you can do at this point in time. Yeah, the, not a lot you can do. And I think it's it's important to remember how you felt when the market was down 33%, right? It's easy now. It's fun now. The market's going up. Your investments are doing great. And that's like, okay, well, you know, should we do anything different? Try to get some more you know, return. But I think it's also important, very important to remember back in March of last year, we were down 33%. I felt like the world was like almost collapsing. It's like, do you still, do you still have that same mindset then? And I think that's when it's really important to kind of ask yourself the question, could I take more risk here? Or like, is this, this is, this is, that was a tough time for me. Yeah. That's a great point because we all have this recency bias, right? You know, we, we forget about the pain sometimes, And, you know, to to us, you know, now is the time to reassess. I think, you know, you don't reassess your allocation after a stock market decline, right? You should reassess your allocation, you know, when you're, when it's, you're at a higher point. And now you may not make a change, but it's good to reassess. I mean, I just think it's, it's a healthy, healthy thing to go through. And it's something we can help you guys uh, talk through and, 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 really come up with a good decision. And, I, and I'll say uh, with that, I'll kick it back out to John and, and just kind of see if he has, if there are any questions that have come in that, that we can help answer. Yeah, thanks, Chip. That was great. Uh, I know I got a lot out of that. So thank you guys. Um, we did have one question and um, right here is, do we think that tax rates will rise? I think that's a really good question. Tax rates. Yeah. So there's been a lot of discussion about that. And, and I, I, again, this is one of those things that the press tends to blow out of proportion, I believe. Um, but with any new administration, there's always uh, proposals. And I'll tell you that in our office, Erin, uh, who's our uh, CPA, and she's kind of responsible for the tax portion of our of our business, but you know, she almost refuses to think about proposals um, because you can't. Nothing is ever uh, ends up in the proposal format. Is just the very beginning. Um, it it never happens that way. Um, I think it's neat to follow uh, the proposals through the process and kind of see the evolution there. Um, I don't think uh, what I've seen. There's nothing that is. A deal breaker. You know, it, most everything impacts people who make, you know, uh, super high income earners. Um, and it's just not that many uh, people uh, in the population that are, are subject to that. Now, um, you, you may be the exception and there might be things that uh, impact you directly. Um, but by and large, proposals are not something that uh, we think you should spend an awful lot of time with. Now, with that being said, there have been four new tax laws, um, well, t- uh, sets of legislation really that are have multifaceted. There are many different tax changes in the last two years. So four different pieces of legislation in the last two years. 
that are having a pretty big uh, impact on people. And now those are things that we can uh, plan around. We can um, make decisions. I know a lot of people have, uh, there's been a change in the way required minimum distributions happen. The age has changed there. There's a change in um, inherited, uh, the impact of an inherited non-spousal IRA, right? If you inherit an IRA, if a child inherits a parent's IRA, that distribution schedule has changed from uh, a lifetime life expectancy to a 10 year time horizon. Well, that's a big, pretty big change. And for some families that could be a, um, a big planning point. So those are the types of things we can handle and, and, and help people hash through and, and optimize those types of decisions. Uh, but by and large, uh, do I think tax rates will rise? No clue. I think there'll change, you know, certain, uh, certain people might, uh, have tax increases, others may see it decline. Um, it's never really a clear cut thing. It always uh, impacts certain people in different ways. Yeah, that's great. Well, thanks so much for that, Chip. I think that was a really good question and a really, a really nice answer. Um, we did have one more question about um, about um, some of by you know with the new administration coming in, is there any um, is there any place where you think maybe our clients or um, other people would be affected or feel the effect of the new administration coming in uh, from an economic standpoint? Uh, again, that's that's one of those questions that is specific to an individual. Um, I just don't uh, you know I don't think that that's uh, any proposals, I think we have to kind of ignore for now. We can be aware of it, uh, but it's just the proposal and the end result are never the same. And, and there's always add-ons and other things that happens. I just don't think that, uh, you know, there's nothing that I see now that would make me, you know, pound the table and say, oh, you know, you need to do this. And uh, it's just, you know, to me, it's, it's specific to a client situation. So that's kind of the way I would, I would answer that. Gotcha. Thanks. I think that's the end of our questions here. Um, if you wouldn't mind going on to the next slide. Okay. Awesome. Oh, one other thing. A lot of these topics, uh, Nick and I uh, on our podcast, Finance in a Flash, which you can get to through, through our website, is kind of a shameless plug. If you go to the insights section, we talk about these uh, types of issues uh, on a regular basis. Every couple of weeks, we post a new uh, podcast. We generally try to limit it to about 20 minutes. And so, you know, I, we just finished up our series on insurance, uh, which uh, it was fun uh, talking that through. Uh, we're going to transition into to a new series uh, coming up, uh, but we're always going to have this um, um, current, uh, you know, current events that happen or anything in the economy or any new tax laws that come up and that sort of thing we'll, we'll hit on. But um, I'm just wanted to plug that and, and, uh, ask that if you guys like this kind of thing and are, are like to uh, get informed, the hope is that it's just educational in nature. Uh, please feel free to uh, subscribe to our uh, podcast and give us five stars. It'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That was a great plug Chip. And yeah, I uh, want to second that as, as well. It's, you know, finance in a flash, you can check it out on, you know, I'll let your Alexa, um, Spotify, iTunes, Apple, pretty much anywhere you can, Google podcasting where you can listen and we do talk about, it's not, you know, just generic stuff. We do have stuff. We just finished an insurance planning series, but we also did a podcast when the whole GameStop bubble happened. We did a podcast on that. And last year when the market was down, we did a series on financial planning opportunities and mid market downturns. And, you know, we talk about different, we did one on financial jargon, which was a kind of a lighter episode. So it's a really good uh resource and all again they're all available on our website under the insights page so that'd be great if you guys could check that out as well yeah and i guess i'll just wrap it up with you know if you got if you all have any questions feel free to give us a call at the office or um, send us an email i know nick chip myself even aaron we'd love to to answer any questions you guys have so i think with that if there's no more questions we'll we'll uh, wrap it up and thank you again for everyone coming. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. See you.